Ghana's Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, and members of the Ghanaian delegation, Ghana's Ambassador to the United States of America, President and Senior Officials of the United States Institute of Peace, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm privileged and honored to be with you here this morning at the United States Institute of Peace, having the opportunity to deliver this speech in front of a distinguished audience, which I believe is willing to engage in an open and frank discussion about our shared commitments and to address the issues that affect the survival and prosperity of this and future generations. I'm aware that I've come to Washington at a sensitive time in the life of this great city. For apart from the daily repercussions of having to deal with the consequences of Russia's 18-month-old aggression against the sovereign nation of Ukraine, the city has now to cope also this week with the effects of Hamas's violent invasion of Israel with all its repercussions for peace in the Middle East. Ghana, like all civilized countries, is firm in her support of Israel and indeed of Ukraine in these difficult moments of their national survival. It is against this background that I've come here from Accra to speak on this prestigious platform about democracy and security in West Africa. I'm, however, comforted in doing so in the knowledge that the inhabitants of this city are aware of the global responsibilities of their nation in upholding freedom, democracy, and security, not just here at home in America, but also across the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, there should be no disagreement about the intensity and scale of the challenges that confront our world and the urgent need to address them. We all agree that the world is in turmoil and we're confronted with perilous situations. Terrorism and violent extremism, climate change, food insecurity, political stability in parts of Africa, post-election violence, health pandemics, energy crises, rising commodity prices, geopolitical tensions, the conflicts in the Middle East and the needless war in, Ura in Ukraine, amongst others, have weakened the foundational pillars of multilateralism. There has never been a time where all these malevolent forces have combined in such a manner to bring hardships to the world. We are indeed operating in the most challenging and difficult of times. The interlocking challenges and the convergence of crises we face pose existential threats that require our media solidarity and collective actions. The challenges we face are many and diverse, but I intend to use this morning's opportunity to highlight briefly two of the most significant issues testing the African continent's resolve. Terrorism and violent extremism in the Sahel and coastal West Africa and its impact on security and the regression of democracy in parts of Africa. I've chosen to focus on these issues because we have virtually run out of time to work together in the spirit of multilateralism. If we do not re renew our commitments to build, keep, and consolidate peace and democracy all over the world. We would have to brace ourselves to live in a new and more dangerous world today and in the future. In Ghana, political instability described much of the early decades of our independence, and we became notorious for sampling every and any type of political experiment. The instability was coupled with the collapse of the economy and led to the exodus from the country of many of our citizens and professionals. 
I'm happy to state, however, that for the past 30 years of the Fourth Republic, we have enjoyed political stability under a liberal democratic constitution and experienced the longest period of stable constitutional governance in our hitherto tumultuous history. The separation of powers is now a real phenomenon in Ghanaian life, promoting accountable governance. The fight against corruption has gone beyond propaganda and is demanding of public officials higher levels of acceptable conduct. Efficient public services are now within reach. We have in this period experienced through the ballot box the transfer of power from one ruling political party to another on three different occasions in conditions of peace and stability without threatening the foundations of the state. The Ghanaian people have manifested in this era their deep attachment to the principles of democratic accountability, respect for individual liberties and human rights, and the rule of law. It has also brought with it more or less systematic economic growth and boosted immensely our self-confidence. We're making systematic advances, especially if you consider that we have just celebrated our 66th independence anniversary and we're able to say that we are indeed making significant progress. For the first time in a long while, young people can make long-term plans and live out of their dreams without interruption. In much the same way, businesses can think ahead, begin to think big and be certain that the laws of the country are not subject to capricious changes. We're all much more relaxed in the knowledge that we live under a regime of the rule of law, and that when disputes arise as they would in all human endeavors, they would be settled fairly. We have not gone to this stage easily and without difficulties. If I were pressed, I would mention in particular the electoral process as the greatest source of potential instability. The trigger for many wars and disputes around the continent can be traced to dissatisfaction with the conduct of elections. We in Ghana have gone through our own traumas about elections. There have been boycotts, there's been anger, and there have been famous election petitions before the courts. I say, however, we have a reliable electoral system which is systematically improving and deserving of the growing confidence of the people. We know that the electoral process remains for many African countries one of the weak links that pose security threats to our democracies and the stability of our governance. But ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest threats to our democracy has to be the proliferation and sophistication of terrorist networks in Africa. They should not only be a source of great concern to the continent of Africa, but they should also be of concern to the rest of the world. Even more concerning is the fact that these terrorist groups are evolving by the day as they scramble to control more territories and natural resources, especially in peripheral communities where the lack of effective state presence and control creates conditions for penetration and ultimately radicalization. Africa has become the center of attraction for terrorist groups which are multiplying in the region, following defeats suffered in other parts of the world. Nowhere is this more evident than in the Sahel. In addition to the numerous attacks orchestrated by these armed criminal gangs, their presence in the region fuels violence along communal and sectarian lines in countries such as we're witnessing Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger. And in the insecurity engendered by the armed groups has resulted in rising levels of displacement of populations in many parts of the Sahel. The fight against terrorism has to be a global fight must pull all our resources together to confront a common enemy. 
The resources dedicated to counterterrorism have to match the resources available to the terrorist groups. The menace caused by terrorism is such that we must share the burden of the fight to be able to incapacitate the terrorists. Our failure to do so leaves the entire world in danger of a spillover effect of terrorism and violent extremism. This is a time for a global coalition of democracies, a coalition of the willing, determined to banish the specter of terrorism and violent extremism. The 11 member states of the 15 member states of ECOWAS, the four military-led states having been suspended, despite the, ec dis the considerable economic difficulties confronting each of them, have made clear their willingness to take the fight to the terrorists if they were sufficiently empowered. The terrorists, as we all know, were chased out of the Middle East and Afghanistan before taking refuge in Muammar Gaddafi's Libya, from where they fled across the Sahara to find refuge in northern Mali after Gaddafi's downfall. They have spread their pernicious influence eastwards and southwards with the coastal states of West Africa, their ultimate destination. They can be chased out of West Africa and the Sahel too. Foreign troops would not have to be involved. West African troops can do the job. The Accra Initiative is a good example of indigenous self-help. Comparisons, they say, are odious, but some cannot be ignored. The Russian war on Ukraine has elicited, according to my information, some 73.6 billion United States dollars in American support for Ukraine. 138.8 billion United States dollars from the European Union and its institutions. And 14.5 billion United States dollars from the United Kingdom. On the other hand, the security assistance from the US, the EU, and the UK to ECOWAS have in total in the same period amounted to $29.6 million. Unfortunately, the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on developing countries has left many countries and regional bodies, particularly in the Sahel, in very dire economic situations. This has compounded the challenges we face in the mobilization of resources to fight terrorists in our backyards. This is the time we must therefore insist that the provisions of chapters seven and eight of the UN Charter are put into full effect to help provide the support required to, de to defeat terrorism and violent extremism. It is certainly not the time for the Security Council to be downplaying its commitments in the area. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot gloss over recent happenings in the democratic space when discussing the challenges of our time. The resurgence of unconstitutional changes of government in some parts of Africa creates a leadership vacuum which inhibits our efforts to address the security problems facing the continent. We'll see military takeovers in Guinea, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Gabon, and a failed coup attempt in Guinea-Bissau. Military takeovers expose further the fragilities of democratic governance in Africa, with these takeovers taking on a now common pattern. The problem we have, and this would apply to most countries on the continent, is that we have already lost so much time that we cannot afford a slow period of growth. We have a dynamic, restless young population who demand and deserve the best in the world. They're not in a mood to wait for the dividends from a slow progression, as the trek across the Sahara vividly illustrates. The pressing challenge for us in Africa is how we negotiate successfully 
the interface between elections and democratic governance, institution building and development, poverty and economic growth, stability and jobs, with the overriding objective being enhancing the dignity of the African. There's little doubt that the extension of term limits by some leaders to strengthen their grip on power creates fertile grounds for military interventions to feed on discontent. Dealing with the problem of coups, therefore, may well start from the civilian governments, which have the primary responsibility to build trust in the democratic dispensation in these challenging times. There should be no backtracking, backsliding, in support for democratic values anchored on the promotion of the rule of law and respect for human rights. And when the coups do happen, we must extend collectively the needed support to the transition process, including in the Sahel, where the military, having tasted power, seem reluctant to restore democratic rule. There is also little doubt about the malevolent influence that is coming from abroad, especially in digital media and sometimes offline media, to assail democratic institutions and practices through ongoing misinformation and disinformation campaigns. It appears to be the prelude for another great power scramble for Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations Security Council has a most important role to play in confronting the challenges I have highlighted. Regrettably, the Council is constrained by its anachronistic anachron anachron structure and methods, which undermine efforts to, ta to tackle contemporary challenges in the most effective manner. The conversations around reforms, which have been going on from three decades without an end in sight, must therefore yield real changes to the structures of the Council to make them innovative in approach. The current structure of the UN Security Council represents a long-standing injustice towards the countries of Africa, and the time is long overdue to address it. It is obvious that the contemporary world has moved on significantly from the post-1945 world, which gave rise to the birth of the United Nations and the, security of the, secu and the structure of the Security Council. The world of 2023, and even less so that of 2050, is not the world of 1945. The crisis of the multilateral financial institutions and the United Nations system which were born from the rubble of the Second World War, is a deep crisis. It will continue until a fair system is put in place, a system that reflects the new balances, no longer based on who lost or won the Second World War, but on the major contemporary and future balances. These balances must take into account new realities, such as demographic dynamics, or access to resources in the context of sex scarcity. In its current state, the Council is finding it increasingly difficult to propagate the rule of law and democratic principles. The use of the veto as an instrument of great power interest is denusing the Security Council of a great deal of legitimacy as the principal instrument for the maintenance of international peace and security. The African Common Position on UN Reform, based on the Azawini Consensus, is of even greater relevance today than it has ever been. It is essential that they be brought back to the center of global discourse. It is only through the reforms that are set out in the African Common Position that will enable the Security Council to be effective in meeting the challenges of our time. And it is only through its effectiveness in maintaining international peace and security that the Council can remain credible, legitimate, and relevant. I believe strongly 
that despite its numerous challenges, Africa is on the cusp of building a great new civilization, which will unleash the considerable energies and huge potential of the African peoples so that they can make their own unique contribution to the growth of world civilization. By 2050, the population of Africa will be 2.5 billion, all things being equal, up from the current figure of 1.3 billion, which will mean that one in four people on the planet will be an African. The median age for this population will be 25 years. A dynamic, young, active population sitting on the resources of the world's richest continent and mineral resources and, and arable land would be a powerful magnet for transformative investment and cooperation. Its potential to generate unprecedented levels of global prosperity are immense. Pax Africana is to be welcomed and cherished. I thank you for your attention. Congratulations on a wonderful speech. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. <coughs> Mr. President, thank you very much for a very thoughtful and wise speech about the challenges uh, that exist. Uh, in uh, Africa and the challenges to the global community. This morning I'd like to uh, ask uh, first about uh, democracy in Ghana and in Africa and then move to the issue of international political and economic reform which you've touched on and then finally uh, talk a little bit about how the United States can be a stronger and better partner with Ghana and Africa. Mr. President, you made uh, a lot uh, of the Ghanaian history of democracy. And indeed, uh, Ghana stands out uh, today as one of the continent's strongest uh, democracies. But we've seen over the last three years uh, in Africa, mostly West Africa, seven countries face military coups, most in your neighborhood. I'd like to uh, ask, what is the foundation of Ghana's democratic strength? And why are we experiencing democratic regression and backsliding in other parts of the continent. Secretary, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to come to this very prestigious institute to talk about matters of great, great concern to all of us. Four years ago, all the 15 states of West Africa had democratically elected leaders. And when you think about, for instance, in my own country, the turnout of people at elections, the numbers are very high. In the eight uh, electoral consultations we've had in Ghana, we've never had less than 70% of, of, the reg of the registered electorate turning out to vote. I think that in itself is a very strong indication of the popular attachment to the institutions of democratic government and to change. And in Ghana's case, as I indicated in my speech, that process meant that on three separate occasions, we've had a government in office being taken out and an, and an alternative party being brought into office by the will of the people expressed through the ballot box. The last such change in Ghana is what brought me to office in 2017. So the attachment 
of people to the process is something that is well documented. And their understanding of what the process means for them and their lives is also well documented. They recognize that they have it in themselves to be able to effect change if they so wish. So the, the jury is out on the next one. There's another one out. <laughs> And I, I'm not here to, to blow the trumpet of my party's new candidate. But I think we have a good chance of being able to survive that experience. But nevertheless, the point that is being made is that not only is the understanding is there, but the effect of it is also very, very strong. That has been the foundation in Ghana, and that has been the foundation of the last 30 years of our existence. And it is, uh, it is against the background of systematic instability in the in the in the 30 years before, right from the first, our our beginnings, which we began with the one-party state and then had a series of military interventions in our governments until we arrived at the consensus in the Fourth Republic that has given us this long period of stable constitutional governance. Fortunately, also it has witnessed a systematic expansion of the national economy. There's still a lot of work that has to be done to produce a transformation in the social economic circumstances of our people, which is our collective goal. But a significant amount has been done, which has indicated that yes, this is the, the path that would most assuredly bring us both progress and prosperity. The circumstances are not the same everywhere in West Africa. We've seen in the countries which have uh, been the, the target of coup d'etats recently, in Guinea, in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, which is the, re the most recent one. Countries that had a very different, have had a very different history. A history where consistently military interventions right up until very recent days have been part and parcel of their body politics. It's unfortunate, but that is the reality that we're having to deal with. And it's also been a period where the development, the capital D that the people are looking for, have been difficult to come by. So the intervention of the soldiers in the lives of these countries is one that I would always hesitate to use the word justified, but can be explained. And that is the tragedy of what has happened in those countries. So we have a, uh, we have a twofold problem to deal with. One, how can we solidify democratic institutions in these countries? And at the same time, and as part and parcel of doing so, how can we generate and engender the economic development which is at the heart of people's preoccupations. In my mind, it is a fusion of these matters that really can explain the developments that are taking place on the continent. The, those of us who are committed to the principles of democratic accountability, of wanting democratic institutions to be at the forefront of the governance systems of our countries, we have a lot of responsibility in making sure that, first of all, in our own backyards, we don't go back on this commitment. We don't have somebody who's elected into office then who then turns himself out to be somebody who's looking for authoritarian solutions to problems, but is prepared to continue the open society, the broad uh, framework of democratic engagement, and that therefore will stick to the institutions of of the constitution of democratic development. That's an extremely important part. And at the same time, invest in development. One of the major investments that we have made in Ghana since I took office has been in our educational sector. We have spent so the equivalent, nearly the equivalent of about 120 billion CDs on our education since I came into office. We have expanded significantly 
the numbers of people who are within the educational bracket. When I came into office, 830,000 people were in secondary school in Ghana. Today the figure is 1.4 billion. 1.4 million because of the policy that my government introduced of opening our secondary education to state-sponsored education that everybody could go to, you don't have to worry about fees. Until I came, 100,000 Ghanaian young men and boys and girls were dropping out of the educational ladder at the level of, uh, uh, of, of, of junior high school because they couldn't afford fees to go to senior high school. That has been taken off. And therefore, those numbers are now being captured within the educational system. I think it's an important mm. com comment mm. on how state resources are being used. Because at the end of the day, it is this empowerment of the people mm. that will enable the reforms and the, 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 the transformation of the social and economic circumstances of our country to, to take place. So these are some of them. Yeah. You have a very large regional, sub-regional organization in ECOWAS. What role does ECOWAS have to play in supporting and sustaining and advocating for democracy? What role does ECOWAS uh, have in advancing policies uh, that will ensure uh, that uh, people benefit from the results of democratic progress. But as I said, I indicated at the beginning, four years ago, right up to four years ago, all 15 elected, all 15 leaders of the 15 member ECOWAS community were elected leaders. And they were so under a protocol, a regional protocol that bound the 15 nations, the ECOWAS protocol of good governance and democratic uh, development, and where the region committed itself, one, to recognizing only democratically elected governments as part of its, of its architecture, and secondly, insisting that democratic values be the central unifying value system for, for, the, for the region. And for, for at least two or three decades, that is what was taking place. ECOWAS's commitment to democracy, to the unity of our nations, was such that it was ECOWAS that led the processes for ending the Liberian Civil War, ECOMOL, some nearly 30 years ago. The same in Sierra Leone, the same in Cote d'Ivoire, and in recent times, it is this same commitment that has led ECOWAS to intervene in the affairs of Guinea-Bissau and in the Gambia, where an elected leader refused to go after he had been thrown out by the people. So as far as the commitment of ECOWAS is concerned, it has been very clear. And it has meant that every time the, the principles have been violated, as we saw in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, and in Niger, ECOWAS did not hesitate to apply the full scale of the sanctions of the protocol to these countries, to make clear our distaste for military intervention in the lives of our various states. The community has also built up a regional organization that is also very vigilant in assisting within limited means, the various 15 member states in their economic planning and development. We've had a, a, a customs union created out of ECOWAS, the EOPS. We are, we've had a West African power pool created out of it, where we share our energy resources. We have had a West African uh, health organization which enables us also once again, which was very critical in the time of, ECOWA, uh, of, of the COVID pandemic. 
leading the coordination of the regional response to the COVID pandemic. So these regional institutions are also there that have been effective in assisting the 15 member states in dealing with their specific problems. And so it has the, the, the ECOWAS has not been just an organization in paper. It has been a very functional, working, dynamic organization assisting the, its members to deal with the problems that it has had. But as I say, the four members that have gone out of it at the moment have meant that the organization has been somewhat weakened and we're having to work on to see how quickly we can repair the restoration of democracy to the, the four countries that, that, that are the subject of current sanctions. Mr. President, to what extent has conflict and terrorism in the Sahel as well as climate change contributed to the weakening of democratic institutions and backsliding in the countries neighboring you, Mali, Burkina, uh, and Niger, in these coup d'etats and military transitions? Oh, I don't think that there can be any doubt that both of these phenomena have, have been very negative, have had very negative impacts on the growth of democracy in our country, and indeed, in the four countries that have suffered the recent military interventions, specifically proposed as a, a reason for the military intervention has been the inability, allegedly, of, uh, with the exception of Guinea, mm. the other three countries, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, of the civilian authorities to deal with the terrorists Insurgents, in, in insurgencies in their three countries. So the connection between the insurgencies and the military interventions have been themselves openly proclaimed by the military. Whether they are a pretext, whether they're genuine, history is what will determine. Because unfortunately for us, in each one of these countries too, far from the arrival of the military contributing to the, the pushback of the terrorists, they seem to have actually accelerated the expansion of terrorism in their various countries. We've seen that in Niger, that since the downfall of Mohamed Bazoum, the, the terrorist insurgency in Niger has spread quickly and more widely than when he was in office. We've seen the same thing in Mali, we've seen the same thing in Burkina Faso. So uh, the connection which was asserted at the beginning of military intervention in these countries, uh, is, uh, is, is not being borne out by the results. But these are the, the reasons that were given. So clearly, there is some uh, nexus between the terrorists and the unconstitutional changes of government. Uh, as far as cl the climate crisis is concerned, the climate crisis is, a, is a, well, it is of course a global crisis, but it, in West Africa it is a crisis of great, great, great import for each one of our countries. Mm -hmm. It's having a major a devastating impact on, on many parts of our agricultural development. It has led to the drying up of Lake Chad, a huge water source that has dried up and has led to the displacement of millions of people across West Africa. It's having a, 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 a very deleterious effect on our economic growth and prospects. So it is very much part of the existential threats that now confront our various countries, both the terrorists and the climate insecurity, the climate change and the insecurity it brings about. So we're having to, to try to deal with all these multifaceted problems, so many balls being thrown up in the air at the same time. But for the mere, this is what, this is what we have. And this is what we have to, to deal with. And, that, and that's what some of us are trying to do. How do you respond to Americans or European officials who say, why should they be concerned? Why should they be concerned about the matters of West Africa, uh, the coups, uh, and the challenges that exist uh, in that part of the world? 
What's your response to those who uh, say uh, uh, we've done enough, uh, uh, it's the responsibility of the leaders of the region uh, to handle these problems? Uh, why should there be global concern about the challenges you yeah, the, the face and what's the, the impact think, on the global community? I don't think there can be any doubt, Secretary, about the responsibility of the leaders of the countries for the problems in their own countries. There can be no doubt about it. Everybody is responsible for the situation in their various countries. But I think that the uh, inescapable fact is that what happens in one part of the world has an impact elsewhere. One of the major co uh, issues of politics in Europe today is the migration of people yeah. from, from sub-Saharan Africa into Western Europe. The barriers are being put out all over Europe against the, 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 the numbers of people who are taking uh, immense risks in crossing the Sahara on foot when they get through to, to, the, to, uh, to, to, to North Africa, having to go on these rickety boats to try and cross the Mediterranean and getting themselves involved in all kinds of problems in Lampasuda, etc., of the Italian. These are all the effects of the difficulties that are taking place in, in Africa. So, you sit in Europe or in America and you say that these are not your concerns. You're deceiving yourself. Mm. The, the, the people are acting in a manner which inescapably has to catch your attention. Mm -hmm. So the issue becomes to what extent, therefore, are you prepared to assist in finding solutions to this? Or whether you think that the defensive posture of putting uh, walls around your country uh, is, is enough for you. Mm -hmm. So. The, the reasons why people uh, are concerned is the reasons why everything that happens in this globe concerns all of us. We are in an interconnected, we talk about a globalized world. What does it mean? It means that things that happen here in America can have their impact in Africa and vice versa. So it is better for all of us to have that conception, to have that mindset that recognizes that at any one stage, we're required to be concerned about what is happening in one part of the world vis-a-vis -vis another, because we're living on the same planet. We are responsible for less than 4% of global emissions. The industrialized world, the Western world, is responsible for some 76 to 78 percent of global emissions. And yet, efforts are being made which require us to take a disproportionate lead in finding solutions mm -hmm. to this phenomenon. It may be that the, the best situation for us is to say that, but this is not our problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So let it be the, 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 the resolution of those who created the problem in the first place. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, for instance, we're told that we should uh, discontinue the development of our fossil fuels. Yeah. But our fossil fuels are not the ones that have given rise to the emissions of the world. Ours are largely dormant. Yeah. So why should we uh, agree to uh, terminating their development? These are all problems that we, we're all having to face together. And I think that the better, the sooner the mindset becomes a more collaborative mindset, the better it is for the human race. Mr. President, you're right. Global solutions are required for many of the challenges that we face around the world today. You talked in your comments uh, about the need for reform of international institutions, uh, both the uh, political institutions and the financial institutions. Uh, in your estimation, what would a restructured uh, UN look like? What would a restructured UN Security Council look like uh, in uh, your view? Uh, and uh, what are the ways of really pushing for this uh, uh, today? Uh, the Biden administration has uh, come out and clearly stated that Africa deserves uh, an additional, deserves a permanent uh, non-veto holding seat on the Security Council. Is that adequate? Is that sufficient? 
Uh, I think that what, those, is, what, what is Africa? I think that the, those words in itself tell you about the limitations of the, of, of, of the policy that is being advocated. Um, the veto power of the five nations is clearly one of the problems of the international situation today. The big problem there is about the Russian invasion of Ukraine cannot be dealt with by the Security Council because Russia is a veto-wielding member of the Security Council and it refuses to allow this matter to be debated and deliberated at the Security Council. The Security Council that is supposed to be responsible, principally responsible for the maintenance of international peace and security is unable to act in one of the most important international events of recent times, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Now that cannot be a satisfactory situation for anybody who has the, 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 the interest of the global community at heart. And it means, therefore, that the reforms that have to be undertaken by the United Nations, I think the most fundamental of those reforms is that we have to get rid of the veto. Yeah. Majority rule on the council? The majority rule on the council. Expanded permanent membership? Absolutely. Yeah, these are, this is the way in which we will have a, 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 a security council that is truly representative of what is going on in the rest of the world. When the people met in San Francisco in 1945, Ghana, we were under colonial rule. It's not, you look at the records of, what, of the people who took place uh, at, at, in, in San Francisco, there's no mention of Ghana. Even in its colonial name, Gokos, mm -hmm. were not there. And there are lots and lots and lots of countries, virtually all the countries of, of Africa were not present. And many, many parts of Asia were not present. So the, the formation that took place there, relevant as it must have been for those who had uh, initiated and uh, concluded the Second World War, did not take into account vast stretches of humanity today these countries are now present on the international security. And therefore, there is a need to create a council and its governing, uh, uh, United Nations and its governing institutions, which take into account the presence of, 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 of all these people. And, <laughs> and, uh, Mr. President, does that mean an advocacy for not just one, but for two permanent African I think teams. that I think that the, the the discussions have to have to of, of course I mean there's a representative nature. China is the only one that represents Asia. There are other major uh, Asian countries: India, Japan, who, who Indonesia, whose claims to representation cannot be ignored. With this, the same, there's nobody from Latin America, so Brazil, Argentina, they're not there. You come to our own continent, uh, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, they're all, they're all these. so the, the, the discussions have to focus on finding uh, an equilibrium for determining the, the contours of representation on, 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 on the council, and secondly, to have a, a, a functioning of the council that recognizes that we can never be in a situation where, whereby one nation, by its exercise of the veto power, can prevent discussions on this or that issue. That there will always be at any one time majorities for how the humanity views uh, progress in particular part. So yes, an expanded membership of the council, which is, makes it a much more representative body. Secondly, a council that operates like our countries do. People are elected by majority vote to go and pursue particular policies. So the council also should be a council that works at the global level on the basis of majority, rep major majority decision making. It's, it's too much to ask for unanimity, because that will mean a, a, a different kind of blockage. Mm -hmm. of, but that majority is work. I think these are some <coughs> of the fundamental contours of the U, new UN Security Council, in which some of us 
of working on seeing come into being. Equally, the international financial institutions uh, here in this town, uh, the IMF uh, and the World Bank have uh, dominated uh, the uh, global financial institutions. Uh, what kinds of reforms uh, do you think need to be made in those institutions? Uh, I know there's a IMF meeting uh, going on uh, this week in Marrakesh and the managing director of the uh, IMF has announced that there will be a request uh, for one new African executive director uh, position to give Africa three executive directors on the executive board, uh, raising Africa's voice uh, and profile in the institution. Uh, is this uh, enough, uh, and is the... Well, it's certainly a step in the right direction. There can be no doubt about that. And uh, uh, the subsequent uh, uh, measures that can be taken around that, all of these are clearly uh, steps in the right direction. <coughs> I think at the end of the day, there's a more fundamental reform of the the Bretton Woods institutions that we have to look at for this 21st century. It has now become obvious when you're talking about mobilizing global resources, <coughs> there is much more resources in private hands now than there are in the hands of public institutions. I, mean, I don't know what the exact equation is, but I believe it's an equation that is at least one to 10 as to what is in the private sector vis-a-vis -vis what is in the public sector. So finding a way where private and public sectors can be brought together to assist in the process of uh, global mobilization has to be the key that all of us are looking at. And my own understanding, the understanding of our government is that the two key institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, should now be looking at themselves as being catalysts for mobilizing these greater resources that they are in private hands to assist the whole process of global development. And the, the role that they will play of being facilitators, garantors, insurance, of uh, taking the whole on the whole process of de-risking the difficulties of the private capital will have in moving into areas, especially, quote, in the so-called global south, has to be the, mo the main preoccupation of the reform of the system. Yes, the reforms in terms of positions, of, uh, of, uh, of giving more space for voices from Africa and other parts of the world, that, that's an important step forward. But I believe the more fundamental reform that has to take place is the reform as to the purpose, the way in which these organizations are going to be operating in the future. And I think there we need a more radical shift in attitude, in structure, and in, in, in purpose. Agreed. I, you're absolutely right, Mr. President. Private capital has to be mobilized uh, and incentivized uh, to uh, work alongside these institutions. One last question on the, on the financial uh, side, uh, the BRICS. Uh, there's been a great discussion uh, in some parts of the global south about the BRICS. Uh, they've expanded uh, to include two new African countries beyond uh, South Africa. Do the BRICS uh, offer an alternative? Uh, I don't know. Well, the, the jury has to be out on that. We'll see. Yeah, because uh, uh, as to how they, they will operate, because uh, the basis on which the choice was made in itself, I mean, uh, Ethiopia, I believe, is one. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's Ethiopia and... Ethi Ethiopia and Egypt have joined Ethiopia. South Africa yeah. as a part of the, the BRICS. Well, is, is there a reason why Nigeria was excluded? <laughs> Um, so, so these, <laughs> so I'm saying that the jury is going to have to be out on this matter. Yeah. We will see as it goes on whether they will operate any differently uh, from uh, the, the other global institutions that there are. Understood. Mr. President, as we wind up, let me uh, ask the question 
Uh, how can uh, the United States uh, be a stronger and better partner to Ghana uh, and to West Africa and to the continent uh, moving forward? Uh, what are the uh, things that uh, people in Washington should know about your uh, desires for uh, better and stronger relationships and what Washington can, can, can contribute to that? I think that when we look at the priorities that are confronting us now, for instance, the fight against terrorism in West Africa, the, uh, the, 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 the absolute imperative for mobilizing the resources that, sus that will sustain economic development, one can see the a lot of opportunity for effective collaboration with, with the United States of America. Uh, as far as, for instance, the terrorist challenge is concerned, many of those who are at the forefront of the terrorist challenge are the same people that American arms and diplomacy has met in other parts of the world. So there's a lot of information and knowledge about how to go about this which I hear in, in, in this city in Washington. And it would be obviously of great use to countries like my own to find some way of tapping into that knowledge and expertise. Uh, the American uh, influence on the multilateral institutions, the development institutions, whether it's the IMF, World Bank, and the others, is considerable, as we all know. And therefore, uh, s uh, involving uh, 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 American support and assistance in the changes that we want into the international financial system and into the process of mobilizing the resources that are necessary for the development of our various countries. There too, the United States can play clearly a very, very prominent and, and forward role if, if it so chooses. And we would urge the American people to look at, uh, to look at these areas of, of engagement as ones that will contribute to their own security and development and therefore to the security of the world as well. One last one, uh, AGOA, uh, the centerpiece of America's trade policy with uh, Africa. Uh, will be coming up for renewal within the next 18 months or so. Uh, any thoughts on uh, the importance of AGOA to the it's continent? Been, it's today? been useful. It's been useful. There are many, many businesses on the continent that have, have grown as a result of AGOA. And I, I cannot understand that there the, the can be any serious reason for, for terminating it. It should be renewed and continued. It's, a good, it's, it's, it's proved to be a very, very useful tool for developing relations between the continent and the United States, and uh, it should long may it flourish and continue. Mr. President, we've come to uh, our time, and I want to uh, thank you very, very much for sharing this time with us, uh, sharing your advice, your wisdom, uh, and your understanding of the challenges uh, that you see across your country and across West Africa. Uh, we also want to applaud the strong democracy that exists uh, in uh, Ghana, uh, and we hope that uh, you will continue to be a strong advocate for uh, democracy, good governance, uh, and human rights, uh, uh, not only in your country, but across the, the continent uh, as well. Uh, we at USIP are enormously uh, proud uh, of the fact that you have given us this time this morning to be with us, and we uh, wish you all the best for the rest of your stay uh, in Washington, D.C. It's been a pleasure to be with you again. So, Secretary, once again, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's been a big challenge and a very, very enjoyable one, and I've enjoyed very much the opportunity to engage with you, the president of the Institute and the others here, on matters which I, I like to think of mutual concern and of interest, both to you and to my own country. Thank you very much. I hope much. the audience will join me.
Distinguished guests, please rise and remain in place for the departure of the President of Ghana, His Excellency yeah, Nana Okufo-Addo.